Then moving on to a, um, the patron manuscript, you can see various tabs across the top. So depending on if you want to look at the different stages, uh, in fact, the, the top level is sort of the top level stages, but then uh, a bit similar to have, as we have now, you have the flexibility to move down and see uh, manuscripts depending on broken down according to what stage they're at. Um, with numbers to give you, an, again, to give you a full picture of how many are at which stage. Um, but unlike the current system, much more flexibility in terms of what columns are visible of what data, the ability, and the ability to reorder or filter on those columns. Um, and this is, as I say, a bit like Outlook, many different possible utilization flags to tell you about what's relevant about an article. And if it's relevant to you, you can click that on, and then it will remember that and always show you a column of that type of flag. And then obviously you have the individual manuscript pages, and the manuscript page gives you uh, all the metadata associated with the article, with the easy ability to edit things like the section, or the article type, or uh, an ability to, to, to recommend a transfer, if that's what you need to do, or to tweak the, um, the uh, metadata. Um, navigation there to uh, other aspects, like to do with tags. We're introducing a new concept of tags for articles, within the new design, so you can have uh, just made up uh, tags to group together articles, a bit like people use tags on things like Twitter or other social areas, and then to be able to represent the content of your journal with what's called a tag cloud, which shows you which, of the art which sort of themes are most common within your journal. Um, another really, okay, yeah, flag, flags, which are set for the thing are appearing there, and then, a challenge with the existing system sometimes is how you keep track of notes on the article. So some, there's typically um, one field and then different people may be adding to that, but it's, there's no real kind of history and uh, it may not become uh, visible. You may want a certain note to be visible all the way through the process, but it's difficult to control that. So there's a concept of sticky notes and warning messages and certain types of notes are just routine, whereas others you, need to, you can actually make them sticky so that they always, and when anybody else looks at this manuscript, that you, you can guarantee they'll see that warning or that sticky note. Uh, that's where you decide you want to watch the manuscript. Um, and then this is a nice view. One of the things which when you're looking at the manuscript, often the manuscript may have had a troubled history, and so it may be that, that when it gets to a certain point, you want to try to make sure that um, you give that manuscript the, the best attention later on, if necessary, to make up for problems earlier. But this gives you a picture of the different stages it's already been through, how long those stages took, and whether those different stages of the process were um, within um, the deadline or not. And so it's just a nice, easy visual way to give you a, um, a, a view of the progress of that article through the program and how long it's taken. And then lastly, as with the um, existing system, there are various more detailed information related to a, a job, um, to a manuscript, for example, uh, who's associated with it, in what role, who the reviewers are, how you invite those reviewers. Uh, if the people who are handling payment, for example, their role, that would give them access to the ability to manage the payment information and the waivers. Obviously, typically, editors aren't involved in that, so in those roles, you wouldn't see that, uh, and that's the flexibility of the role-based system. Um, and you can see here, um, just again, the whole history of the history of the notes for the um, manuscript and also the history of all the activity on the manuscript um, and associated tasks. And again, as we've evolved the workflow system, the concept of tasks has become very important. And so many of the aspects of what goes on with the journal are, are, will be driven by tasks and we're making sure that a task has a certain deadline and mostly associate editors have to make sure they handle their tasks within a certain, within that time frame. Oops, Okay, so obviously um, you may have some questions around that, but a very, one of the most important questions is, well, it all looks interesting, but when is it gonna happen? So there's a huge amount of work to take all of the functionality, or to take all of the things which the system needs to do and really think through how, the, how that kind of design should apply to them. And to also break it down into manageable chunks of work, figure out in what order they can be implemented, to figure out ways that a lot of the benefit can be achieved without having to wait for the entirety of such a system to be fully kind of all rolled into one. And 
so the design phase really has been going well. Um, we've got, we, have, we have got a lot in place that's not fully complete. There are still some areas to be fleshed out, but we are aiming to have that essentially complete by the end of June, so the end of the first half of the year. In terms of how we go about implementing it, we already have enough of a picture to be able to do the initial architectural planning. How do we design a system that's capable of doing this sort of flexible thing, that's capable of being scalable, that's capable of really working like this? Um, and we also have the team in place in terms of the new CTO and working to get in place really good technical uh, staff and resources, both internal and external, to be really planning the implementation phase. Um, I'd say it's going to be really important to define a phase way of doing that, but we will be aiming to be releasing, um, having uh, some, yeah. We obviously want to, we will involve editors throughout the process in this iterative testing, but we'll be aiming to have an initial release of it in use in early 2012. So that went on quite a while, so I may be slightly running out of time, but I did want to touch on the other, um, another pillar of Springer's growth plans and how it relates to Biomed Central. So emerging markets, clearly big opportunity for Springer to grow, and a huge opportunity as well for Biomed Central to, uh, to develop. And we can really benefit there from um, Springer's scale and existing kind of global presence. So we've already been doing that in China and Hong Kong. So Springer have offices both in Beijing and Hong Kong, we have three Biomed Central staff, two in Hong Kong, I believe, and one in uh, Beijing right now. Um, Leo Chung is in Hong Kong, Dan Wang is in uh, Beijing, um, and Leo has an assistant there. Um, but we were also actively recruiting for an editorial acquisitions person um, <coughs> uh, based out there. And we also have um, a, a, an advocacy person in Japan as of um, last month. And Spring has been very much actively encouraging us to be quite aggressive about this, uh, this growth and hiring. And so within the next 18 months, we will be expecting to be bringing staff on board, focusing on Biomed Central and open access um, in India, in Singapore, which is the new Springer office, which is being opened later this year, um, South Korea. And then also the USA. We already have one member of staff focusing on institutional sales in the US, and that's worked really well. Um, Springer has a big New York office. Currently, our salesperson is more of a sort of roving salesperson, not based in, in New York. But we are looking to um, build an editorial team in the US as well because we're getting a lot of uh, it's very helpful relationship we have with Springer New York because that's where their uh, medical publishing team is, 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 is based. And they're giving us lots of leads for open access medical journals. And some of those things, they're often US based um, <coughs> um, prospects. And so having what's commonly referred to just simply having somebody with an American accent to talk to those people is regarded as being pretty helpful. So we're going to be hiring a couple of those people. Um, I wanted to um, give you a few stats on just how important this is and what the potential is. Uh, last year I showed this graph as well, and it was sort of, we wondered if it would um, keep growing, but as you can see, um, the absolute numbers and the percentage uh, just keeps going up. This is the number of percentage of articles being submitted to our journals um, from uh, China as compared to the rest of the world. And so last year there were 5,500 articles coming from a submitting author in China. Oh, sorry, that, that, that's the first four months of this year. And that, that's 12.5% this year, up from 10% last year. So it really is continuing to, um, to grow and becoming a very, very substantial part of our Central's activity. In terms of the top journals, just maybe a curiosity, cancer research, a very big area in terms of what's coming from China also genomics and bioinformatics. Um, 